So, chapter 9, verse 1 to 3 is where we're going to start. Let's read it together, verse 1 to 3. But all this I laid to heart, examine it, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. That the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So, as we always do, let's quickly go back to the beginning. So first of all, he starts by saying, but all this I lay to his heart, to to heart. This is a continuation from the last chapter. And something occurred to me this week that I wanted you to bear in mind in your own personal reading of this book. This book is a sermon. The word which is used to describe Solomon is preacher, koheleth, preacher. And ecclesia, which is where we get the word ecclesiastes from, actually means assembly, a gathering of people. And so what the book of Ecclesiastes is, is a preacher talking to an assembly. So when we read this book, we have to understand each chapter is a continuation from the next. It's one big sermon. Solomon would have preached Ecclesiastes to you, not kind of gone through it like we go through it, but literally preached these very words to you. Ecclesiastes is a sermon. So carrying on, he says, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, Man does not know, both are before him. So this is an interesting verse here because he once again brings two groups of people, the righteous and the wise. And he brings them in and he says they've got deeds, right? But what's interesting about this is he says whether their deeds, basically referring to their deeds, whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. When he says him, he means God. What's interesting about this is what he's saying is the righteous and wise, when they do deeds, they may have the pretense of being good deeds. They may be outwardly seem like good deeds. But what he's saying here is actually only God knows if they're coming from a place of love or hate. And I thought to myself, this this reminds me of Jesus with the Pharisees. The Pharisees would preach on street corners, pray out loud have people come to them for counsel. They would lead the services and be in the temple, leading the temple services. They had the pretense of their deeds being holy and good. The Pharisees, in every outward perspective, were good men. But Jesus, when he encounters them, what he says to them, and it's, it's, it's terribly harsh, he says, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus saw the heart behind the deeds. Now, if you remember last week, once again, remember this is a continuation, a sermon. Solomon was talking about how the wicked go in and out of the holy place. We learned this last week. And how they're celebrated by many men. But that doesn't mean they're not wicked. And Solomon's kind of continuing that thought. Hey, listen, just because they do good deeds, just because their deeds may seem good, understand something. Only God knows the heart with which they do them. And sometimes it can be from love, and that is good. But other times, he says, it can be from hate. And one day God will expose their hearts of uh, of which they did the deeds with. The Bible talks about worshippers and it says, They worship me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. So people are able to worship God in their, with their mouths and out loud, and it gives the pretense of worship, but God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And I would really advise uh, the church, myself included, before you come to Sunday service, before you take part in worship, weigh your heart. If there's something you know that is just, uh, it's just niggling at you, it's in the way between you and the Lord, weigh it, test it, pray about it. Come to worship with your heart worshipping and not just your mouth. 
because God says they worship me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. So the idea here is that God one day will test the inner hearts of each deed that we do, whether it was from selfish ambition or hate, or whether it was from true generosity and love. Let's carry on. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and to the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And his, he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil that is done under the sun that the same event happens to all. What is the event? Death. What Solomon's saying here is death doesn't discriminate. Black, white, female, male, poor, rich, good, bad, righteous, wicked. Death is coming for you all, for us all. He doesn't discriminate. So what he's saying here is he puts everyone in the same bracket, every single type of person you can imagine, and says, guys, death's coming. The same event happens to every single one of them. And for Solomon, there's two main things he wrestled with throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. One is God's sovereignty. He wrestled with the fact that God was in control. It was something that seemed to really just frustrate him that God was sovereign and there was nothing he could do to change it. And the second thing he wrestled with was death. The fact that death just seems to wipe everything away, just wipes the slate clean, just takes the point and meaning out of everything for Solomon. And then the third thing he really wrestled with was how God is sovereign over death. And he was just, he couldn't get his mind around it. I think Solomon would have been much happier if we lived in a world where the righteous and good didn't die and the bad died, right? Solomon would be very happy and it would make a lot more sense to him if good people didn't die and they got to live forever and then bad people died. That would make sense to Solomon. But the difficulty with that is this. Whose moral compass are we going to go off when it comes to good and bad? Because every single one of us in this room, when not looking at the moral compass of God, we all have different moral compasses. Some people think this is bad. Some people think that's okay. Some people think this is bad. Some people think that's okay. All of us think good and bad are different in our own relative terms. That's why the Bible doesn't tell us to look at our own understanding of good and bad. It tells us to look at the perfect God's understanding of good and bad. Now, if we were to go off God's moral compass for, okay, the good survive and the bad die, who's going to survive? Because <laughs> the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. So even if we were to do that, we're all dying anyway. And Solomon actually confirms what I'm saying in the next line. He says, also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So Solomon confirms it. Even if it was that the good survived and the bad died, we're all going anyway because our hearts are full of madness and evil all the days we're alive. Now, a very important doctrine to understand is the doctrine of human sinfulness and human depravity. I don't, many of you may have been there when we'd done a sermon a couple of months ago on quite literally just that topic, human depravity and the human condition. And some people can get frustrated. Aaron, you talk so much about human sinfulness and how bad we are. Like, surely enough is enough, right? But the problem is with that is, simply put, and this is just simply putting it, the greater our understanding of the human sinfulness and human depravity, the greater our admiration will be of Jesus Christ and the gospel. He who is forgiven of much loves much. He who is forgiven of little loves little. The more you understand how sinful and how depraved and how lost we were, the more you can appreciate how saved we are in Jesus Christ. And the more you'll love him for, having what, he, for what he's done. So the, the doctrine of human sinfulness is an important one to understand. And Solomon doesn't shy away, shy away from it. He says that man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. Let's carry on, verse 4 to verse 6. But he who is joined with the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done 
under the sun. So let's go back to the start. He says, but he who is joined with the living has hope. Now we have to remember, Solomon is referring to an under the sun understanding. So we're talking about a very worldly type of hope. He's basically being very simple with it. The the living have hope in the fact that they're still alive, in the fact that they have hope of the future, hope of what might happen tomorrow, hope in their achievements, hope in good times. So the hope he's talking about is very temporal, very worldly hope. But hope for Christians when bringing it into a New Testament concept is an incredibly important part of our walk. In Corinthians uh, chapter 13, it talks about faith, hope and love abide and then it says but the greatest of these is love but it tells us to abide in those three faith hope and love and faith and hope are inseparably linked when we pray we pray believing in faith that God is listening to us and can answer our prayers and then we hope he will When we're in tragedy and when we're in difficult situations or when we're going through suffering, we believe and know that God is here with us, but we have hope to him bringing us out of it. And even if he doesn't bring us out of it, we have hope of our future with him in heaven. We have an eternal hope. Quite literally waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back is hope, is it not? We are literally hoping for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. We believe he's going to come back and we are clinging to our hope that that faith is real, that he's going to come back and restore all things. Hope is such an incredibly important part of life. So he's saying quite simply that the living have hope, but the dead have nothing. How can the dead hope they're dead? It's a very kind of simple way to put it. And Jesus shared an understanding of of. This, it seems that Solomon can be quite harsh towards the dead and we can sometimes think, well, that's a bit disrespectful, you know, they're, you know, they're dead, leave them alone. Luke chapter 9, verse 59 to 60, this is what happened with the Lord Jesus when he asked uh, someone to follow him. He said, to another he said, follow me. But the person said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ saw a whole different type of dead in this world. And please excuse the pun, because I know there's a show titled this, but what he saw was the walking dead. Jesus saw how without the life of Christ inside of you, without the Holy Spirit, if you're walking around this world, the Bible quite literally says a person is dead. They have no life. They may be breathing. There may be oxygen coming out of them. uh, Sorry, carbon dioxide coming out, oxygen going in. But they are still dead. They have no spiritual life in them. And as the Bible teaches, spiritual life comes way before physical life. It's far more important and key to human existence. So when Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, he's talking about two types there. Jesus himself understood that when someone is dead, that's it. Our job is to focus on the living, focus on who is still here. There's that lovely um, kind of evangelistic testament, isn't isn't it? When When we start to lose hope in someone ever being saved, we say, well, they're still alive. There's still hope for them. As long as they're walking and breathing on this planet, there's a chance that God will save them. But when we have those tragic moments when someone dies without knowing the Lord, there's this tragic mourning because we understand that's it. Their chance is gone. They ignored, they ignored, they ignored, and now it's too late for them. They're done. And that's a, that's a tragedy that we mourn, but our, our mindset, a bit like the Lord, should be right now on to who's still living. Now on to who can still be maybe saved. So it's, a, it's an interesting one, but it's one that death is, it, when put in a biblical perspective, that's kind of where death has its place. Our job is with the living. God will deal with those who have passed. And he carries on. He says, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Remember, Solomon's the guy who wrote Proverbs. So we're going to get some pretty poetic sayings in Ecclesiastes, okay? So for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Really simply put, it's better to be alive than to be dead. That's what he's saying. If you have a mighty lion in Africa, and he's strong, he's mighty, he's the king of the land, and he's the only lion in the land, and he's dead, if I then put a chihuahua, 
or a poodle next to that lion, that chihuahua and poodle is now mightier, stronger than that lion. He's now the king of the land because the lion is dead. So that little doggy is far more powerful than a dead lion. So what he's basically saying is to be alive is better than to be dead. That's pretty much it. You don't need to make anything more of it. That's what Solomon's saying on a very worldly base, on a very under-the-sun understanding, it's better for you to be alive than it is to be dead. Because when, you have, when you're dead, you have nothing. Solomon took it one step further in other chapters and said it's better to have never been born than to have been either alive or dead. So he just takes it from one extreme to the other. Now, he says, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. But now, when we take this from a New Testament point of view, that I can think of one Christian who actually would have disagreed with him. I can think of one Christian in particular who would have actually disagreed with Solomon on this. And that's Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 1, when talking about death, this is what he says. For to me, to live is Christ. But to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me, so I can do the work of the Lord. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. Paul's saying I'm really struggling to choose whether to live or whether to die. Because if I'm to live, I'm going to work for the Lord. But if I'm to die, I'm going to be with the Lord. And me personally, I'd rather be with the Lord. But for your sake, I better stay and continue working for him. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul says, it's better for me to go, but for you guys, it's better for me to stay. Now, I just want to make something very clear here. Paul is not endorsing in any way, shape or form suicide. Okay? With a lack of understanding, you could read this and think, oh, blimey, he's endorsing kind of ending it all. No, 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 that's not at all. Paul at this point is in prison, in chains, awaiting what could possibly be his execution. So Paul is writing this, understanding that his death is about to happen. And he's basically saying, guys, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going home. But then he says, I believe God's probably going to spare me for your sake. So he's not talking about ending his life by himself. He's simply stating the fact that for a born again Christian, death does not have the same meaning that it does for everyone else. It's a doorway to Christ, not to the end of everything. So it's an extreme difference. Now, some people would say, Aaron, but that's a bit strange. You're saying one person in the Bible is saying this and the other one's saying this. Surely that's the Bible contradicting each other, right? Surely that's two great men of God contradicting one another. Therefore, Scripture's contradicted. No, because Solomon is talking under the sun and Paul is talking above the sun. Solomon is coming things from a worldly perspective and Paul is coming at things from a godly perspective. Far, far different. So there's no contradiction. Basically, we have the unbeliever's understanding and the Christian's understanding. That's the only difference. Let's carry on. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. So Solomon says they know that they will die. You know, even the knowledge of knowing that you will die, Solomon is saying, is better than being dead and having no knowledge. Even the knowledge of knowing there's an end is better than being dead and having no knowledge of anything. And he says they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, when I first read this, my instinct was to think about godly reward, reward after death. But I realize that's not what Solomon's talking about. We have to remember, once again, he's referring to a worldly understanding. So when he's referring to reward, he's talking about reward in this world. They have no more reward from their toil, no more reward from their hard work, no more good times, no more reward. If he was talking about reward after death, it would contradict what he said previously about the dead having nothing, about them having no knowledge, no truth, no nothing. So the reward he's referring to is a worldly version, basically saying the living have good things, but the dead have nothing. And then he continues in saying their love and hate and their envy have already perished. So you know how Solomon has talked before how all humanity toil and work out of envy? He's saying that the love and hate and envy in their heart perishes with them. And this is true for the individual. But I just, when I was studying for this, something really came to mind. Yes, it is true for the individual, but there is also an aspect where love, hate and envy carries on after you die. 
Now, what I mean by this is if, let's say you have a father and he raises his son to hate a certain ethnic, ethnic group in the world, yeah? From a, from a young age, he raises him to hate that group, teaches him how to hate it. And as the son grows up, he just hates and hates and hates because that's all he's taught. And then the father dies. That child is going to continue to hate that particular group of people. That father's hate is still continuing after the grave. And the same can be said for love. What we invest into people now does last after we are gone. If someone disciples someone, raises someone, looks after them, all their Christian walk, and then that person dies, the fruit of that person's life, who they were discipling, will continue. So even after the grave, the work they were, do they were doing is continuing in that person's life. So Solomon's completely right. Love, hate, and envy from the, from the point of view of the person is gone. But the effects of their love, hate, and envy in this world continue long after they are dead. Long after. It says, continue, it says, forever they have no more share of all that is done under the sun. Now, once again, I don't mean to repeat myself, that stands true for the person who's dead. But the greatest evidence that we can bear fruit that lasts after we, dead, after we are dead is the Bible. 40 authors, over 40 authors wrote the 66 books in the Bible over the span of 4,000 years. Not one of the authors, apart from the Holy Spirit, not one of the authors is alive today. And yet their work, their trust in God, their faithfulness is still bearing fruit now. So when they're judged before God, when the Apostle John stands before God and says, you know, God, please weigh my life, the Apostle John's going to have no idea that the words he wrote down in all of the books he wrote in the New Testament are all going to be added to his fruitfulness of his life, are all going to be added to his reward. That's going to be a heck of a reward. It's been read for thousands upon thousands of years. So the work we do for God has an eternal value. It does last after death and it is recompensated. There is a reward. The Bible says God is no man's debtor. The reward is given eternally. And that is strictly for Christians, not for non-Christians. Only Christians in this world are able to have eternal work done. Only Christians. Verse 7 to verse 10. Go. Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. So he says, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Now, I actually had a great conversation with our brother Paul the other day about joy. And we came to a fantastic conclusion about the two different types of joy in this world. Temporal and godly joy. And they're very, very different because what Solomon's saying here is eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with joy, enjoy them. But the joy he's talking about is an under the sun joy. The joy he's talking about is linked to physical things. Drink your wine with joy, eat your food with joy, enjoy something you can see and touch. But what happens when it's not there? What happens when you haven't got food or you haven't got wine? Where does that joy go? So the joy Solomon is talking about is a joy that's attached to physical things. But the problem with that is when those, when those physical things disappear, the joy disappears. As Christians, we are called to have a whole different type of joy. We are called to have a godly joy. It's not a joy in what we can grab in the moment. It's not a joy in something that we can see right now or something tangible that I can hold in my hands. It's a joy in knowing what God has done for me. It's a joy in knowing who God is, and it's a joy in knowing where I'm going. So I may be in a terrible situation as a Christian, and it's okay for me not to have any temporal joy. Job was not smiling and laughing when he went through what he went through. I took that one from Paul. 
I'm going to give it back to you. Paul said that. Job was not smiling or laughing when he went through what he went through. There was no temporal joy in Job. He had nothing to cling to. But if you read the book of Job, there are, there are moments, there are glimpses where he shows true joy in who God is. So we are not always called to have a happy face. Sometimes as Christians, we think we have to have smiles. We're not always called to be happy and to be, have a big smile on our face. Sometimes we go through things that make us cry. We're in pain. We're in agony. There are things in this world that we won't be very happy with. But through all of it, we are called to have an internal joy, an eternal joy. One that surpasses things of physicality and is purely linked to our faith and our hope in God. That is how Paul is able to walk towards his execution with joy in his heart. That's how people like Peter, Stephen and the other martyrs were able to go through what they went through. Not because they took joy in the actual physical pain that they were going through. I'm sure there was no joy in that. They took joy in knowing and believing that God was real and that he had them in the palm of his hand. So there is an eternal joy that we're called to have all the way through. Let's carry on. He says, let your garments be white and let no oil be lacking on your head. Now, on a purely practical level here, in hotter climates, especially Arabic countries, most of them will try and have white garments because white reflects the sun. But when from a biblical level, white garments appear many different times in the Bible. A virgin, when married, wears a white garment, a white dress. It's a signifying of purity. The 24 elders around the throne in Revelation, they had white garments and gold crowns. And the martyrs in Revelation who are killed in the tribulation, Christ gives them white garments to wear. It's a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of uprightness, of being right before God. What that word righteous means is right before God. So when he says, let your garments be white, for me, when I read that, I hear, be righteous, be upright, live uprightly before God. And then he says, let not oil be lacking on your head. Once again, from a biblical perspective, we have many different examples. Christ was anointed with oil before his death. In the New Testament, in, in this day and age, people in this church who are sick are called to come to the eldership and the eldership in James chapter 5, according to James chapter 5, anoints them with oil for healing. And we've had some of that in this church. It is used for the anointing of Aaron in Exodus and the anointing of the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt by Moses. The anointing of oil is all the way through the Bible and the, the idea, the symbolic idea behind anointing of oil is purification and cleaning a purification and cleaning aspect to it it used to be that the blood in the temple was sprinkled onto the temple it was kind of sprinkled they used to sprinkle it with these these like leave kind of things onto the temple in the new testament do you know what it says christians are sprinkled with the blood of christ sprinkled clean because it has a cleaning, purification. The anointing has a purification element to it. So he's saying, let not oil be lacking on your head. There is also the physical, practical aspect as well, that in that time, wealthy people would anoint themselves with perfumes and oil, make, them smell, make themselves smell nice, and it would be a luxury. So you can take both of these things. You can take them from a biblical perspective of kind of more of a New Testament way of thinking. And you could also look at the practical element to wear white garments, nice linen, and to perfume yourself with the anointing of oil. Let's carry on. He says, Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. Now, I know there's some people who aren't married, and there are some people who maybe have been married and gone through difficult situations. But I am going to talk directly now to the husbands in the room, okay? Because it's strange for me that Solomon would mention this. Out of everything he's mentioned, you see, marriage is a very strange thing. And I'm not the only one who says it. The Apostle Paul, literally in the New Testament, says it is a mysterious thing. You have two human beings 
who meet each other, court for a little while, and then decide to do life together. To sleep in the same bed and live in the same house and to go through different trials, good, bad, wicked, righteous. They decide to just join together in holy matrimony and live this strange life together. That's kind of odd, right? <laughs> I'm not saying it's kind of it's kind of odd that two random people just join together. And yet in the Bible, it is one of the most precious covenants in God's eyes. I think Solomon mentioning this here is so unbelievably important because often what we try and take pleasure in is everything else around us. We try and find pleasure. But what Solomon's saying here is food, drink, clothing, oil, and your wife, everything you're usually taking for granted, everything you wouldn't usually appreciate that much, that's what you should take pleasure in. You know the food that you take for granted? Take pleasure in it. You know the wine that you have in the cellar and you take for granted? Take pleasure in it. But then the most amazing one, you know the wife you have whom you love? Take pleasure in her. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. Now, from a biblical perspective, there's an order that God has when it comes to a man's importance, a man's priority in life. And I'm going to lay out that order for you right now. Number one is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's number one. Sorry, ladies. He's number one. Second, only to the Lord Jesus Christ, is your wife. Let me say that again. Second, only to the Lord Jesus Christ, is your wife. Believe it or not, third is your children. Yes, they come after your wife. And everything else comes after that. Everything. To take this one step further to prove my point, in the New Testament, when it's talking about spiritual leaders, eldership, pastors, it lays out requirements for them. And do you know what the requirements say? Husband of one wife, children to be submissive towards their parents, and their house is in order. What God says is this, how do you think you could possibly care for my household if you're not properly caring for your own? How do you think you could possibly love my bride if you're not first loving your own? Love your bride, treat your bride right, respect your bride, honour your bride, and then maybe I'll let you do the same to my bride. Or maybe I'll let you look after my bride. But if you can't look after your wife first, if you can't love your wife first the way you're meant to love her, don't come to God thinking you can love the church. So I love the fact that Solomon says this, about wives and I think it comes down to this word contentment be content with what you have be content with who you have marriage in itself is the very representation according to the apostle Paul of Christ and the church marriage itself is the very representation of Christ and the church so if Christ loves the church, invests time into the church, spends time and and honours and respects the church. If he pours himself out for the church, how much more should husbands do so with their wives? That's the example we've been given. So husbands, some of you have been married longer than I have. Some of you have been married less time than I have. But I have something to say to you. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. Make sure you are treating her as God would have you treat her. And let me just finish with this when when I'm talking about this particular subject. If a man pours himself into ministry, let's say I poured myself into the church and I just dedicated every second to it and I neglected my wife, God will not honour my ministry because that is not in God's order. He says, no, Aaron, first care for your wife, then you can care for the church. Or if I pour myself into ministry and I pour myself into God's word and I evangelize and preach on the street and I'm out there all the time doing God's work, but I neglect my children, God won't honor that. God's order has to be followed. Sort out your household first and then you can come and look after mine. Oh, I don't know what I said. Sorry. (laughs) And I, and, and I want to put this out there because my wife's sitting right there at the front row, right? I haven't got this perfected. 
I'm still working at this. She's smiling. I'm still working at this. I want to just put that out. It's like a little, like the, like the little writing you get, just a, like, just a little warning. I'm still working on this, but it is so important. And sometimes the things closest to us are the things we take for granted. We don't need to work on this right here because that's so close to us. We need to work on everything else. No, absolutely not. You need to invest as much time as you possibly can into your wives. And you may be thinking, Aaron, this is awfully sexist. Why not wives to husbands? Tough. Really? Tough. Let me just put it to you like this. Your wives do not have the same responsibility over you as husbands that you have over them. Just point blank period, that's it. In the Bible, your wives do not have the same responsibility over their husbands that their husbands have over their wives. That's it. I'm not going to address the wives, I'm addressing the husbands. Look after your wives. Let's carry on. I just made some enemies in the room. Let's carry on. All the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Once again, the idea here is be content. You have a plate of food in front of you. He's given you a certain amount. That's what you have. You're not going to have any more, have any less. Be content with what you have. Carry on. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you're going. This is once again a simple statement when you break down the poetry of it. When you do something, do it to the best of your ability. If you're going to do something, do it with all of your might, all of your knowledge, all of your thought, all of your wisdom. Don't be lazy. Don't be half-hearted. If you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability because when you're dead, you won't have anything. Solomon had no time for lazy people. In Proverbs, he quite literally said, if you don't work, uh, sorry, Paul in the New Testament said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Believe it or not, if someone came to this church and they said, you know, we're hungry and we need, we need help. Yes, okay, that's what we're here for. But first of all, especially if you're a husband, let me assess, what are you doing to try and earn money? And if they're doing everything they possibly can to work and it's just not happening, we're going to help them, we're going to love them, we're going to support them. But if they're getting up at half three in the afternoon, and if they're wait, wait, all up all night just doing whatever they want to do and they're not looking for jobs, not handing out CVs, not willing to humble themselves and do something like laboring or gardening or anything like this, like decorating like I do, if they're not willing to humble themselves and do this stuff and they just want to sit at home and wait for God to give them, Paul says, no, 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 they don't eat. Don't feed them. No laziness here. There are no lazy people in the kingdom of God. And Solomon himself is very harsh on laziness in Proverbs as well. He says, the sluggard, that's what he calls them, the sluggard. Let's carry on, verse 11 to verse 12. Again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favour to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that fall into a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. So just going back to the start, he says, Again I saw under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favour to those with knowledge. This seems quite contradictive statements, doesn't it? Because surely the swift do win the race, surely the strong do win the battle. So it sounds kind of counterintuitive. And it made me think, and I don't mean to, this is, a, I'm just warning you now, it is a little bit of a different context, but it did make me think of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God has made the gospel foolish and perceived it by people as weak. And the foolish and weak message of the gospel is the very message that is the salvation unto men. In 1 Corinthians 1 it says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Solomon's contradictive statements are how the world views the contradictive gospel. It's a foolish, foolish message preached in weakness, and yet it leads to the salvation of men. And when you look at Jesus Christ himself, he was not something to be aspired to. We say this time and time again, born to what would be considered peasants of their time. 
raised in a very normal, standard, working-class family, three years of an amazing ministry, and then dead. To the Greeks, it's foolish. To the Jews, they demand signs. But Jesus Christ, even though the world's perspective of it may be so ridiculous, the gospel is the saving grace of the entire world. So Solomon's contradictive statements just instantly took me to the gospel and made me think, you know, God does exactly the same thing. He uses the people in this world who are weak and foolish to shame those who are strong and wise. Let's carry on. But back to Solomon. Why does he make this remark? Well, he says, secondly, he says, but time and chance happen to them all. Now, when we read that, we think, hang on a minute. All the way through this book, Solomon has struggled with sovereignty. Are you now telling me there's such thing as coincidence and chance and things out of God's control? Well, in my understanding, no. Solomon is looking at life from a human perspective. And so whereas we may view something as chance or time or coincidence, that is a human interpretation of something we really don't understand. Last week, I used the analogy of me walking outside and getting hit by a bus and dying. And some people being like, oh my goodness, what a tragic coincidence or what an accident. From a human point of view, it would be time and chance. But we know that the Bible teaches that the days of man are numbered. That was my day, according to God's sovereignty. So when he says time and chance, it's purely talking about the human perspective of God's sovereignty of world. It seems to us like time and chance, but it is not time and chance. But that still doesn't explain why Solomon is saying the remarks around... The, is that my granddad's phone as well? Oh, granddad. Oh, granddad. I'm related to you as well. That's ten times the shame. Oh, dearie me. It's all good, I forgive you. <laughs> There's no condemnation in Christ. <laughs> People on the internet will be like, what on earth is going on? Let's carry on. But that still doesn't explain why Solomon is saying the remarks around the fast don't win the race, intelligent, etc., etc. And I think this next, these next couple of verses explain why. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. What is the net? What is the snare? What falls upon them? Death. Back to that same old topic, death. Solomon brings it up again and again. Now, there's two interesting observations here about the, about the analogies used about the, the bird and the fish. The first interesting topic here is the bird and the fish both have to move towards the net and the snare. The fish will swim into the net and the bird will fly into the snare. And he's using those analogies to explain how humanity walks towards something that they don't know when it's going to come. Because the snare and the net have to be a surprise to the fish and to the bird. And in the same way he's saying, us as humans are walking towards an event that suddenly falls upon us. I don't know about you, but I don't know when I'm leaving. But I know that I'm walking towards it. And it could happen at any moment, any moment, when it suddenly falls upon them. Let's carry on to verse 13 to 16. He changes the topic a little bit here. I have seen also this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. There was found in it a poor, poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered the poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard." Solomon's talked a lot about wisdom versus the attributes of the world, right? He's told us how wisdom is better than having 10 rulers at your side, how wisdom is better than the protection of money. And now he's using the example of a mighty king with a mighty army coming against a city with a very small amount of people in it, and yet a poor, lowly man, through wisdom, is able to save that city from a mighty king and his mighty army, all through using wisdom. A biblical example of this would, uh, I want to go into it quickly, a biblical example of this would be the Gibeonite deception. Very, very quickly, I'm going to try and explain this to you. Joshua in the Old Testament was going through the promised land according to God's will and destroying all the people. 
Jericho had fallen, the city of Ai had fallen, and he was taking out, he was doing what God told him to. God said, when you go into the land, wipe everyone out because of how detestable child sacrifice and orgies in temples and things like this, wipe them out. And so Joshua had the command to go into the land and wage war on all the different people. And the Gibeonites saw what Joshua was doing and thought, we can't, we can't beat him. And it's interesting in the Bible, when you read the story, they say we can't beat him because the God of Israel is on their side. So they, they actually believed that the God of Israel was with Joshua. So what they did is they, they tore their clothes up, they muddied their clothes, they put on their donkeys satchels, which looked very, very worn, and they traveled to Joshua, and they said to Joshua, we come from a very, very distant land. <laughs> the Gibeonites were smack bang in the middle of the promised land. And they said, no, we come from a very, very distant land. We've come to offer you sacrifices. We've come to give you gifts. We've come to offer our services. And Joshua says to them, are you from this land? Because if they had been, he would have wiped them out. They said, no, no, a very distant land. Look at our feet. Look at our attire. Look at our donkeys. We've traveled a long, long way. And they believed him. And Joshua made an oath to the Gibeonites that he would not destroy them. And then it was revealed that they were actually Gibeonites. And Joshua said to them, what is this that you've done to us? And the Gibeonites said, we knew that the Lord of Israel was with you and that we could not survive. And we did this to save ourselves. Now we will be your servants. To this day, they're still around. They were the people who deceived, in a way, Joshua, but they did it through wisdom. And where did that wisdom start? In fear of the God of Israel. That's what led to their wisdom to then deceive Joshua and make it so that their whole entire people survived. That's an example of a small amount of wisdom being mightier than the incredible army of Israel. And it disarmed even a battle happening. <laughs> That's what wisdom can do. And yet at the end, it's interesting, it says poor, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. That's because his wisdom was attached to his social standing. As a poor man with no social standing, he could have all the wisdom in the world. No one wanted to hear what he had to say. And yet that same poor man saved the city. So for Solomon, what vanity is that? You know, what vanity is it to have all of that wisdom and for no one to listen to you, even after you've saved an entire people from being destroyed? Verse 17 to 18, the power of wisdom and the power of sin. It says, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So it says, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not bringing politics into it, but I just have an observation to make about this. On YouTube a couple of weeks ago, I was, I'm, I'm not very educated when it, I'm not very educated in general, to be honest. I'm not very educated when it comes to parliamentary proceedings and things like that. And I just got interested. I thought I'd have a look at what parliament looks like. Right? I don't know if any of you have ever YouTubed what Parliament looks like when they're debating and they're discussing. But there's this guy, he's the House Speaker or Speaker or something like that, and he spends the whole time saying, order, order, order. And he does that because the people on either side are shouting petty insults at each other. Order, order. And it's like a playground. It's a bunch of posh lads and posh lasses in suits shouting at each other in a big hall with a guy in a big seat saying, order, order. They are leading our country. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they are in charge of our country. Listen to what it says. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than what? The shouting of a ruler among fools. I'm not going to say anything else. Wise words are not often said loudly. And wise words don't need a big crowd. Don't need many people around them for wise words to be spoken. Wisdom is not about appearances or pretenses. It doesn't need to be appreciated. Wisdom is just true. That's all it is. And it's often said in quiet. It's often said quietly. It isn't needed to be in many words or, or speaking very loudly. It's just said quietly. But there's another aspect to this. Wisdom is where we speak, how we speak, but it's also the crowds we keep around us. Proverbs says, bad company corrupts good character. 
that foolish king who was shouting, he may have had charisma, authority, he may have known how to talk in front of people, but who was it said he was surrounded by? Fools. Bad company corrupts good character. There is wisdom in also understanding the people you associate with, the people you surround yourself with, the inner circle of your life have an incredibly important role in defining you and who you are. Why is it that in the end times God says do not neglect the meeting of the saints? Because he understands where we need to be a smack bang in the middle of the family of God in this time. Bad company corrupts good character. He carries on, he says, wisdom is better than weapons of war. Wisdom can prevent many catastrophes, but one of the things it can most definitely prevent a lot is violence. A man who lacks wisdom will be very quick to violence, very quick to confrontation, because that's just his instinct. He's going off his natural instinct, and he lacks all kinds of wisdom in order to not do that. And what, what kind of scares me a little bit, it says wisdom is better than weapons of war, <laughs> There are some very unwise people in the world who have their fingers on the red buttons, right? Who have the keys to the nuclear bombs and have the keys to the armies, and they lack an awful lot of wisdom. It makes me think, uh-oh. But wisdom is better than weapons of war, and that's proved in the story we just told about the Gibeonites. It's also proved in the story of Solomon with the, with the poor wise man and the mighty king. And then this last line, very interesting line. But one sinner destroys much good. One sinner destroys much good. Now, the ultimate example for me of one sinner destroying much good is the chief of sinners, Satan. This world was perfect. Perfect. No pain, no decay, no nothing. One sinner, chief of sinners, Satan, and look what he has done. The next example I thought of, a couple of sinners, Adam and Eve. Through Adam came sin and death to the entire world. They disobeyed God. They rebelled against God. Sin, in its essence, is rebellion against God. That's what sin is, a rebellion and disobedience against God, a going against what he has told us not to do. So Adam and Eve, through their sin, brought into this very world death. One sinner brings about much bad. One sinner destroys much good. Nothing is more evident of that than what Adam and Eve did in Genesis. And then one more example, because I don't want us to shy away from responsibility. Us. Us. Now I know we have been transformed from sinner to saint. I understand that. We are no longer in that category. We have been set free, saved, redeemed. And yet, the sins we have done in this world, even before we were saved, and sometimes even while being saved, leave their mark. They leave their mark. You can have an incredible Christian leader, and he could have an incredible ministry. All he has to do is mess up once publicly, and it tears down everything he's done. The higher you climb, the longer the fall. The more public, the more exposure you have to the public, the more in the light you are, if you sin, if you sin in a way that is so evident, you can make entire groups and communities of people stumble. One sinner destroys much good. Satan, Adam and Eve, and humanity are evidence of this. Now, I've got another thing to put. If, if one sinner, if one sinner destroys much good, how about seven billion of them? If the Bible says one sinner destroys good, how about seven billion of them? Why do we wonder how the world is how it is when there's seven billion sinners? If one destroys much good, look what is being done to the world as we speak. And it's not for Christians to shy away from responsibility taking. Because there was a time when I didn't know Christ. And I myself added to that. One sinner destroys much good. How one man brought sin into the world, Adam, and yet one man came to defeat sin and take it back, to bring us back, to reconcile us to God. Through one man came death, decay, and evil, and through one man came life 
and birth and the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to us himself and gave us, this is incredible, the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry we have of reconciliation, bringing lost children back to their rightful father. That is, in Christ, God was reconciled to the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, and this is to anyone in the room who doesn't know Christ, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, in this church, I don't know who would, but just in case, we talk an awful lot about Jesus. We talk an awful lot about Jesus. And really, I, I have it in my heart that for the rest of my life in ministry, there should never be one message, one sermon ever I preach that does not have the gospel in it. So if anyone here is a bit like, oh, really, again? Put some earplugs in, or there's the door, because this church is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ministry of reconciliation is why we're here. We have been reconciled. We are children who were lost, and we have been brought back to the Father by our Lord Jesus Christ. It is now your job to go out there and reconcile others, to tell them that there is a reconciliation they can have through and in Jesus Christ. That is the message we have. It's not our job to actually drag them in. It's our job to tell them about the reconciliation that has been made available to them. That's the gospel message. Now, we're about to go into discussion, and I think we'll have worship a little bit afterwards. That's okay. We're going to go into a discussion. But what I would like you to consider, and I've never asked the church to do this before, and it's not something I would ask usually, I would really like you to consider death. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like you to consider death. I want you to take some time to actually think about it, to really stop and consider death. And the reason I'm asking you to consider this, not something I would normally ask you to consider, is because you've got two camps when it comes to death. The Christian camp, where there's hope. Like Paul talked earlier, there's a doorway to Christ. We're going home. And the other camp of anyone who's not a Christian, which is filled with uncertainty, confusion, fear, doubt, not wanting to embrace it. The reason I'm asking us to actually consider death is it isn't until you consider death that you then consider life. Solomon says to be in the house of mourning is better to be in the house of laughter. And also for the Christians in the room, before we break into discussion, I have something else to say to the Christians as well. When you're thinking about death or, or you know, uh, comprehending it, if you find yourself, even as a Christian, but having thoughts of the other camp, confusion, fear, doubt, uncertainty, the Bible tells you as Christians to have assurance of where you are going, to have no doubt no fear of death. To understand as a Christian, it is the doorway home. Death is the revealer of what you actually believe in. It is the revealer of what you actually believe in. And when you start to focus on that, when you spend a bit of time focusing on it, you will find God will bring things out from your heart that maybe you haven't realized before. It may be as a Christian, you're a little bit uneasy about death. But I want every single one of us in this room to be where Paul was when he says, it's better for me to depart. It's better for me because then we will hold a lot less tightly to this world and hold on a lot more tightly to the hope we have in the next. So I want to break for discussion. Make that the center of your discussion. Have a chat about it. Let's see what comes up and feel free to pray 
and, and do that in your discussions as well. Okay, so let's break, turn your chairs, small groups, three to four, four to five people max, and let's have a chat together about it.